All right, my name is Greg Limecooler. I'm a prosthetist orthotist, um, third generation. I've been doing it my whole life. Very lucky to have that opportunity. Um, today, I'm gonna try and speed things up a little more than I would like to, but um, just to get things going, cause we're a little behind. So I'm gonna talk fast. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about today was some actionable things with orthotics and then also with prosthetics. What we're starting with is microprocessor knees and limb length. Um, I'm a clinician and see patients every single day. Um, so this is something that we do see normally with uh, our transfemoral population. Microprocessor knees have been around a long time. Um, they have gotten better throughout the years with better accelerometers and gyroscopes and uh, weight sensors in the knees themselves. The um, main thing is, is increased stability and safety in these knees compared to um, a lot of the mechanical knees. They have uh, things built into them, such as stumble recovery. So when a patient catches their toe, it, it, const it will sense that and then put more fluid into the hydraulic cylinder, tighten it up so that the patient has a few milliseconds to actually put weight through the limb and catch themselves with their sound limb. Um, one of the big improvements with um, microprocessor knees is also that patients use less energy throughout the day. When we're adjusting the microprocessor knees, you can change the heel rise, the knee extension, um, as where in typical knees, you never could do that. It was just set at one specific walking speed so we really do see a reduction in energy throughout the day and safety with toe clearance because of all of those. Um, as far as microprocessor knees go, the standard has been the C leg for quite a long time now. Um, like I mentioned, there's a lot of improvements in the accelerometers and gyroscopes, the fully waterproof, uh, Military grade hardened ones are only covered by the VA. No other insurance will cover it. Um, that's the X3. And then uh, we've been working on as an industry trying to get the uh, household ambulator K2 level ones approved with more than uh, just Medicare. And even that's a battle um, because the level two ambulators increase stability, stumble recovery, all of those things sound great for the household ambulator who has trouble walking. Uh, one of the newer ones on the market that I really wanted to talk about today was the Alux uh, 2. This is the first four bar microprocessor knee with a hydraulic cylinder on it. Um, it was made by Proteor, Proteor, which is a Japanese company. Um, it's kind of a mix of mechanical and um, and microprocessor knees. So the four bar linkage is a glide and slide motion instead of a, um, actually, instead of a single axis. So we'll talk about the ALUX in a second, but the single axis uh, C-leg, it has a max weight limit of 300 pounds. Anyone over 300 pounds cannot use this knee. Um, the weight of the knee is 2.8 pounds, battery life, 40 to 45 hours, which is pretty good. Um, but that does make the knee heavier as far as knee flexion, 130 degrees and the knee center to pyramid distance is 40 millimeters or 1.5 inches. That's a big deal. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, the Alux, like I said, is a four bar polycentric knee with a hydraulic cylinder and that lets it glide and slide. So the knee motion is actually smoother. Um, it also has better cosmesis for sitting for amputees because the, when they sit down and the knee center actually comes further back. So a lot of people who have a long residual limb, they have trouble with cosmesis when they are not only sitting, but walking, um, it definitely looks different. So the Alux has, um, max weight limit for a patient of 275 pounds. We all know people are getting bigger and hopefully this will be changed soon uh, to higher numbers, but we'll see. Um, and then the battery life on this is 96 hours, which 
As you can tell, the weight of the knee itself is also higher. It's 3.4 pounds, which is a problem for suspension and prosthetics. Um, the max knee flexion angle is 180 degrees, which is way better. So for cyclists and people that are kneeling down and bending all the time, this is a better option for them. And then the build height distance is from the knee center to the pyramid is 33 millimeters and 1.29 inches, which is much better. Um, as far as components go, um, when you're trying to decide uh, limb length um, with the prosthesis and the knee, um, these are some of the uh, components that you have to use when you're talking about good proper suspension. Um, a gel locking liner, um, you can have that with a kiss system or a puck lock. Um, and the distance between the end of the residual limb and the attachment point of the gel liner is 19 millimeters. And I'll explain why I'm going over all of this in a few seconds. Um, the actual attachment point into the socket itself is 25 millimeters prosthetic neath um, the prosthetic socket itself is five millimeters. And then the rotating adapters that we use to align the knee and the adduction and abduction of the socket itself. Very important to have those um, 25 millimeters. That sometimes can be eliminated if we're really fighting for height, but we always try to keep that because it lets us have a more efficient gait pattern. Um, so the total length of all that is 2.9 inches. So how does this translate to limb length? Well, we have these great microprocessor knees. We have all this new technology that has been coming out, but we still need to attach it to the patient's limb. So how do we do that and keep the knee center of the prosthetic side equal to the knee center of the anatomical or sound limb? Um, so when we're looking at like amputations, we really are looking for a residual limb length to the distal end of the residual limb, not the femur um, of around four and a half inches or 114.3 millimeters. That's putting all of the um, components and factoring in the knee center heights of these high end prosthetic knees. Um, that's a big deal when you're talking about gait mechanics. Um, if you have a correct knee center, a prosthetic knee center, you end up having a smoother gait with less compensation for hip hiking and vaulting, and it makes it a lot more efficient for the patients. Um, as far as, you know, amputations go, you can't always just decide, oh, I, I have this much length that I need to amputate, but when you're working with an, a patient that's going to have an elective surgery, thinking about this is very beneficial in the long run for the future of the patient and how they function. All right, next up, um, just at the end of the prosthetics, we're doing 3D printing. Um, we've been doing this for a while now at our company and other uh, O&P companies have been doing it around the country for a while also. Unfortunately, 3D printing still has got a long way to go. Um, right now, it's mainly test sockets. Um, that's a diagnostic socket that we use for the actual fit and to make sure the skin and pressures are correct. Um, they are not strong enough and can tolerate enough torque um, and the forces that go through daily use in the prostheses. Um, so eventually, we're going to hopefully have better 3D printing technology to manufacture a definitive socket here soon. Um, a lot of places are doing like coverings and cosmesis stuff with the prosthetics and 3D printing, but the technology is not quite there. Um, I am advising everyone I know and work with across the country to start getting into this though, so that when the time comes, we can actually all start using it right away. It uses a lot less material. All right. Um, I'm going to move right on into the ankle foot orthotics 
because I want to get through this and talk about some insurance issues <laughs> that are happening in the industry too. Um, I know everyone likes all the fancy technology and all the new stuff, but uh, the tried and true metal AFOs, they still have their place and I don't think they're ever going to go away. Um, for patients that uh, see these, they always say Forrest Gump and my grandfather wore one of those, but a metal AFO is very, very um, important in clinical use because we have more diabetic patients. We have more vascular patients. We have patients with tons of edema. And when we're looking at fitting that patient with an AFO or a KFO, how do you put a plastic brace or a carbon fiber brace on someone that is constantly changing their volume? They're going to end up with skin breakdown. They're going to end up with rubbing and pressure ulcers. Um, so the metal bracing, unfortunately, is never going to go away, but it's also a benefit because it is very adjustable. There's so many different things we can do with it. And I don't have to worry about trying to fit a brace inside of someone's shoe. Um, the brace attaches to the outside of the shoe, which is a big deal with any uh, AFOs. Patients come in with flip-flops and slip on shoes or Crocs. And uh, that is a big issue is having shoe wear. One of the other things that um, has been around for a long time are leather ankle gauntlets. Um, they're still great. If people are, we're trying to control triplanar motion, someone is a candidate, is not a candidate for ankle fusion. Um, this is circumferential compression. It holds them in the AFO very tightly and securely. So it's comfortable for all day use. Um, it really is a great option for um, people who have multiple issues and we can make it out of lots of different thicknesses depending on the patient. So just like anything else, you get to know the patient, figure out what they're doing on a daily basis, and we can adapt any brace to accommodate their lifestyle. Um, plastic AFOs have been around forever too. We have the PLS, which is there, more flexible. Articulating, which is great for um, actually active stretching because uh, you can get some dorsiflexion instead of a solid brace where you're not stretching at the ankle, um, articulated bracing. We do it a lot for nighttime stretching for children who are growing and they actually are constantly getting tight and then loosening up. And we just need a little extra. Um, and while they're sleeping, it really helps. And then floor reaction AFOs, uh, they can help with quads, quad weakness patients. Um, a lot of people aren't going to want to wear a KFO or can't tolerate wearing a KFO. Uh, and in order to control their knee buckling, uh, floor reaction AFO can help with that. It does not control any knee hyperextension. So there's always a fine line of once you get the patient up walking, trying to determine which type of brace would be best and then tuning it with heel wedging to get the right shank angle for ambulation. Um, carbon fiber AFOs, we really do like carbon fiber AFOs because they're lightweight. They fit in almost any shoe. They come in a ton of different um, designs. You can have a floor reaction style. You can have medial lateral. Um, you can have flexible. You can have rigid. They're amazing. They store energy from mid stance to terminal stance and then terminal stance and pre-swing. It's actually assisting with giving a little bit of that energy back and it can help with patients clear the floor if you have a little bit of a weak hip flexor. So the carbon can do that as where plastic metal bracing, none of those actually assist with that. Um, as far as fitting in shoes, of course, like I said, shoes are always a problem with any patient, um, but the carbon fiber bracing fits in almost any shoe. It's a flat foot plate. The downside of that is it does not control any varus or valgus at the ankle. Excessive pronation and supination can be um, 
accommodated for with foot orthoses that are put on top of the foot plate. Um, but once again, that is something that, you know, every patient's a little bit different and we have to make uh, that call when we see them. As far as um, the downsides of carbon, like I said, you, ha you can't control varus and valgus. So a lot of the patients, um, this isn't a great option for. The patients that it is a good option for are elderly. Uh, patients with MS really benefit from this. Um, and children actually do really well with carbon AFOs. And sometimes because I can get wider shoes for kids, um, in some cases we can put an SMO and do a plastic uh, carbon hybrid. And then the last thing before I talk about insurance quickly is uh, a mixture of orthotics and prosthetics. So AFOs um, with a partial foot toe filler or partial socket um, toe filler, they work amazingly well. When you lose your great toe, of course, you're losing balance. We're always trying to give stability and balance back to patients um, and prevent contractures and deformities. So when someone loses their great toe or their uh, transmet or um, other partial foot amputations, they end up always wanting to go into plantar flexion. They are always rubbing on the distal residual limb. So in order to control that, because they're searching for balance, you do a flow reaction style AFO with that uh, prosthesis foot cup in there. And it is amazing to see these people get up and walk and they're so much more active. We have less skin problems and further deformities in the future. Um, there are a lot of other types of AFOs out there. And I know um, we've brought up BioNest. We're constantly trying to get insurance companies to approve things like that. But unfortunately, they do not um, right now. Even prosthetic knees have kind of changed. We had power knees that were microprocessor controlled um, that actually had e extension assist. Um, and that manufacturer stopped manufacturing them because it wasn't profitable. Uh, so we're always lobbying Congress, trying to get more insurance companies to pay for higher end devices and things like BioNess. Um, but one of the um, things is I'm talking to a bunch of uh, physicians. I want to remind uh, everyone that in order to get any kind of device, um, especially nowadays, they're getting more strict. We need a face-to-face -face visit or telehealth visit with an MD, DO, PA, CNP. Uh, clinical notes from that visit. I know this all is super repetitive, but it's always a, an issue in our industry to get all this stuff uh, quickly and efficiently so we can get the devices done. Um, so rationale for the device, the duration of use, uh, patient's motivation is usually something that's kind of skipped over in the notes. Um, and the insurance companies really are looking for that now, that the patient wants to wear this, that they're willing to wear it, and they're motivated to use the devices, whether it's a prosthesis, a prosthesis or an orthosis. Um, and then also for uh, almost all insurances, the patient has to be ambulatory um, for any orthotics. It can't be that they might be ambulatory once they get this. They actually have to be ambulatory um, in order to get a device. And prosthetics is uh, pretty similar. They will have a little bit of leeway with insurance if the patient can stand and transfer but isn't ambulatory because obviously they don't have a limb at the time. And then we need a generic uh, start order. It can just say something simple like left AFO and then once we have all of that, we can get a detailed prescription sent over. Um, any questions? I know that that was quick and also just a general overview, but I want to keep moving along. Questions. All right. No, thank you.
Our next presenter is Robert Anderson, the upper extremity sensory prosthesis. Let's see if I can find where it went. Here we go. Always a leap of faith embedding videos on these. So this is kind of a follow on on what we saw from sensory and lower extremity. Um, as a disclosure, I don't have any commercial interest in anything I'm talking about here. Uh, thanking DARPA and the VA for funding our research. Um, similar list of, of personalities. You'll see a lot of uh, familiar faces up here. Michael Keith was really kind of the granddaddy on the surgical side of this. Dustin Tyler is the driving force uh, in the lab on the PhD side. And I'd like to thank my uh, uh, co-surgeon, Kevin Malone. So demographics, these numbers are from 2009. So we're about a dozen years out of date, but uh, amputees, about 1.7 million. So one in 200 adults in the US. And there's a very different demographic. Uh, the lower extremity in that year, we had about 56,000. The majority of these, uh, at least at that point in time, were vascular or diabetic. So these are people who have a very, or a potentially abnormal limb proximal to the level of amputation. Uh, in the upper extremity, we had about 1,900 uh, major amputations, so about 30 to one. Uh, the majority of these are traumatic and tumor. Uh, by far. Congenital, you may or may not have a more normal proximal limb, but in, uh, in especially in trauma, we generally have the benefit of a normal uh, neurosystem above the level of injury. Relatively small dysvascular. There have been uh, you know, prosthetics of the feet dating back to the Egyptians. Uh, there have been you know, the old Captain Hook hook, probably the first major uh, uh, engineering innovated prosthetic system uh, known as Guts of the Iron Hand. This was uh, an amputation suffered in battle in 1504 and prosthetics developed over about the next 15 years. Uh, over the following six centuries, uh, we have you know, your basic passive, your, uh, the common body powered prosthetic and more advanced myoelectrics and finally the multi-degree of freedom myoelectrics. Um, you have a lot of uh, activity-specific prosthetics, uh, things designed to throw a ball, shoot pool, fishing, weightlifting, guitar picking, anything you can really come up with. When you talk to the, the amputees, the users of these devices, they're just that. They're devices. They're tools um, that people will think about. I'm going to put on my arm or put on my device to go uh, the, the same way I would use a very different hammer uh, to drive a, a, a stake to, pa uh, to hold up a tree versus what I would use for a to put in a finish nail. Um, but these are not integrated in the self. I think there was, um, and what's lacking is sensation. I think there was a beautiful line in that uh, last video that Hamid showed where his patient said, uh, I put back to feel my toe. Upper extremity prosthetics don't say that. It's not my hand. It's my prosthetic. Uh, it's my tool, uh, but they don't say my toe. And I think that patient was reintegrating. And I think it's the sensory that does that. Uh, these are just a quick video just to show how important sensory feedback is in, in uh, motor use. This is a Swedish uh, occupational therapist doing this. Uh, obviously uh, an intact normal hand, striking a match, very simple task. In the, second set, in the second video here, she's had lidocaine blocks of her digital nerves to uh, thumb index long and ring, but she has full normal motor control. She has normal proprioceptive feedback from her wrist up and of the motor tension in, the, in uh, her flexor and extensor tendons. A, process, a uh, upper extremity amputee would not have any of those benefits even. And you can see she really struggles with this. Uh, you know, sensation is really key to function. So what do we need to kind of close the loop and allow good feedback? Well, you need it, first of all, obviously to be non-noxious. If something hurts, nobody's gonna use it. You need it to be natural, you need it to be intuitive. Some of the early attempts at reproducing sensory uh, perception in the hand uh, were to, put a buzzer on the skin. 
And that does work. It does get feedback. It does improve use, but it's not natural. It's not the way the brain has been used to dealing with this limb for decades. And what happens is when people get flustered, when they get overloaded, they lose the ability to, to make that extra necessary cognitive leap and interpret that non-natural sensation as integrated sensation or normal sensation. Ideally, you need it to be multimodal. You have temperature, vibration, pressure, proprioception, pain. Uh, you know, having those multimodal being uh, distinguished uh, by the neuroprosthesis is really useful. It needs to be localizable, uh, especially in the hand. The more precise uh, you can tell where something is being touched, the more useful it is, rather than there's something touching my median nerve distribution somewhere versus just the radial side of my thumb. Uh, it needs to be stable over time. Uh, if it's not, if it changes either electrically in character and in intensity, uh, then it really becomes a lot less useful if the person is, again, constantly having to make that, cog that extra layer of cognitive ad uh, adaptation uh, to interpret what's coming in. So fundamentally, the issue is signal. This is on the myoelectric side here, but I think the point is, is uh, still the same. When you have a myoelectric pickup uh, from the outside of the body, your, that signal is going to change as the residual limb changes size, uh, as you sweat, which changes your electrical conductivity, as you gain or lose fat over time, that's an insulator, uh, or even just as the residual limb moves in the prosthetic socket. So while uh, you can get a couple of channels out of a myelectric prosthetic pickup, it's difficult to get more than that. And it's even more difficult to do that in a stable way over time. So generally you want to go to the inside. Early attempts at this, we saw something similar to this for brain gate. Um, this is a two millimeter spike array. Uh, the digital nerve would be, or sorry, the, the uh, sensory nerve would be traversing this way. So this is gonna penetrate the nerve at different depths and allow you to stimulate different parts of the nerve uh, or different fascicles. Very different from in the brain, you have a much more robust scarring response uh, in peripheral nerves. So this really didn't work very well. Um, partly it was the signal protocols that were being put in tended to generate paresthesia. Again, that violates the non-noxious rule. Uh, and there was, uh, as scar forms around these tips in the peripheral nerve, they were having to hit it harder and harder and harder electrically to get the same response. And ultimately it gets to a point where you can't safely dump that much current into a peripheral nerve without risk of injury. And these implants had to come out. Uh, here in Cleveland, we're uh, leveraging some of our electrodes from the FES center that you've seen a few times this morning. This is an old four, uh, four point of contact spiral cuff, um, uh, first generation C fine, uh, where the nerve would be traversing through here. And you have multiple points of contact. This is four contact. Uh, this is a uh, flat interface or uh, C fine. So we have eight points of contact in this one plus, uh, or really seven plus a grounding strip. Uh, and these were kind of the workhorse for the first generation uh, of the symptom, uh, systems I'm showing here. Uh, implanted, this is a first generation sim uh, system. I would have uh, these cuffs on median ulnar and radial nerve in the residual limb. Uh, first guys were distal to elbow. We've now moved that to proximal to elbow without any degradation of localization. Uh, they have a, a connector between the implant and at the moment, percutaneous leads coming out, similar to what you've seen uh, before today. These go into a fairly standard nerve stimulator driven by a computer. Uh, to put in the waveforms that we want to put in. So radiograph, you have these pretty uh, small little cuff electrodes, a whole mess of connectors, which has been one of the real focuses and advancements over the last 10 years since this went in, uh, and then a precutaneous array that hopefully will be going away over time. How does, what do we need to do to get sensation? Now, the beauty of it is the brain is a parallel processing computer. What does that do really well? It pattern matches. So this is, I love this. You've seen similar artwork. This is the cover of the 60th anniversary of SI. This is an array of other covers of SI mimicking the first cover. Why do we, and I think even before I put that up, you'd appreciate this as a stadium and a baseball player. How do you do that? Well, if you think about it, really, if we were to super zoom in over here, what you have is an array of very small blue, green, and red pixels. So even the left isn't a true image. We're not looking at a baseball player here. We're getting close enough to that that your parallel processing computer matches that pattern. 
The beauty of that is I don't have to generate the perfect uh, exact same sensation or signal pattern for touch that you're using right now. I just have to get close. So multiple modality encoding. Uh, fundamentally, we're putting in basically a square wave. Um, you can think about modifying the pulse width, the distance between pulses or the frequency, and the pulse amplitude. And that gives you a lot of state space that you can explore. As it turns out, what they were first putting in were uh, pulse trains, square waves enlarged here and squished in time, but square waves at a constant pulse rate, sort of mimicking a sine wave. The pro and anywhere you do that, anywhere from one hertz up to about a kilohertz, and the vast majority of the time that's perceived as paresthesia. It's just, a, if you ever touched a live wire, you know exactly what that feels like. Um, and again, violates the rule of non-noxious. That's not gonna work. Turns out, uh, you know, the, the first thing that, that we ran across in sort of exploring the state space is if you prime it with, with a burst uh, for a few milliseconds and then hit it with a, with a regular rate, um, described by the, by the patient as feeling like uh, running a comb over. It's just a, a residual tap, 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 and it matches the frequency that you're running in that, that uh, 2 to 20 hertz wave. Uh, they can sit, even when they can't see what the stimulator is doing, they can tap it out on the table for you and you'll see that it perfectly matches. So as you explore space, uh, you can come up with a number of things you can vary. It turns out if you have a big ver uh, sinusoidal variation in the amplitude uh, of the wave, you end up generating a feeling of constant pressure. If you have a, a shorter uh, or a smaller modulation, you end up feeling that distinct tick, 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 tick. So you have vibration and you have pressure encoded here. We've sort of also come across proprioception as we explore the possibilities here. Localization goes back to how many of those contacts do you really have over the nerve? You're stimulating a few fascicles. You're stimulating the fascicles closest to the electrode a lot, and one's more distant, less, drops off as an inverse square function. Um, so these are marked, you know, just are, are the first subject where he's feeling, you know, the third median channel uh, localizes pretty well to thumb, owner a uh, little less well with a lot of overlap, uh, radial right where you'd expect. Stability over time. This is what's uh, really useful. This is over the span of almost a year um, that the individual channels tended to run true. Uh, interestingly, we picked up and then localized a little bit more on one of the M5 channels. And as we run through other subjects, we have similar findings here. Uh, our longest system is now nine and a half years implanted. We're not seeing significant changes in this. It tends to lock in uh, and settle down over the first few months as to where it localizes. I suspect that's a function of the scar capsule building around the C-fine electrode and just keeping the electrode in place mechanically over the nerve. Um, that's harder to prove, at least in people. Um, it's also stable electrically. We're not having to increase the voltage uh, over time. And this is out to two years. Uh, these things are whatever signal works at, at day one or it, once it's incorporated is going to work out to a couple of years at least. So functional demonstration really can't go far without putting this video on. This is, this is our first subject. Uh, my my uh, postdoc is a little sadistic and came up with this one, pulling the stem from a cherry. So in his, in his own hand, he's holding the stem of the cherry. The task is to pinch it, the cherry with the prosthetic, and pull off the, the stem without popping the cherry. Uh, you know, too loose, failure, too tight, juice. How, how are people really doing these tasks? Um, the, you know, sensory augmentation aside, uh, they're generally for the myoelectrics listening uh, to what is the, or how hard is the motor working? in there. Uh, they can tell what kind of force they're putting on things to a degree. Um, and they substitute their eyes uh, to know whether they're touching it or not in absolute terms. So we're going to blindfold them. We're going to put a white noise headphone on him. And assuming my video will cooperate, uh, we end up with you know an attempt here and juice and lots more juice. Um, cutting to the chase, he got six out of 15 in his first trial without juicing him. Uh, so surprisingly better than we thought he'd do. Um, however, now all, the only difference here is switching on the sensation. And it's this is a pressure sensor feeding back. This is just taped onto his own myoelectric. 
It still takes a little bit of getting used to it, but it does pretty well. And uh, I think we have one juice in here, and even that one was a soft call. He still has trouble localizing because we're only giving him one channel of contact here uh, in this system. That's our one juice. Anyway, how did he do? Went 14 to 15. If we took the blinders off and took the earphones off and gave him full normal ability, he would go about 29 for 30. And even then it was kind of a little tight to call it, to say that he failed the one he failed. So what are we doing with these now? Uh, where is this project at? We've uh, gotten it to home use. Uh, this is the same subject. Um, we're still running externally percutaneous leads down to a uh, stem box, but it's one that he can wear in a fanny pack. I really like this one. Uh, that he, with the system off, won't hold his daughter's hand with the prosthetic. Um, and we kind of ask patient, we ask family, what do you notice him doing? What don't you notice him doing? What's new and different? And the remarkable one for us was uh, he'll pick up a bottle, a plastic bottle, a uh, single use of water and drink it with the prosthetic. He will squeeze ketchup onto his hamburger, uh, which imagine doing that if you couldn't feel it. Uh, you're either going to get none or, you know, a ketchup burger. Um, so it really is uh, making some uh even in the short term, this fairly rudimentary version of things, uh, he's really doing well with home use. Current status, more contacts. Uh, that patient has four channel leads in. Uh, the current generation are eight channel leads. We're stepping up to, uh, this is a 16 channel. Um, and it's just more points of contact. Again, you're, you're, as you put in, you're covering the fascicles. And by having multiple channels, you have more selectivity. Uh, the next step in that is actually field shaping. So right now it's a very simple, uh, one charge is being placed to one of the 15 contact pads and the ground, but you can mix that up. You could put a little charge here, a little charge there, a little opposite charge here, and, and then the ground. And you can shape where that electrical field is. You can sort of drive around which fascicles you're stimulating at a given time, uh, giving you more selectivity. What's next? Uh, where are we at? Well. More channels, more channels, more channels. Uh, good for sensation. As a practical matter, those connectors take up a lot of room. Uh, we're getting to uh, where you need a multiplexer just so you're not running quite so much, uh, so many wires out of things. Moving to fully implanted. So the signal generator and the battery will be in essentially a pacemaker housing uh, connected to all of this. So we don't have the, the percutaneous array anymore. Um, instrumenting a, uh, we're currently using a DECA hand, but uh, instrumenting the fingertips and the ulnar border and the thumb uh, for pressure feedback. So closing the loop on the system. EMG control. Uh, so we talked about bidirectionality uh, with the need, but I think that's really the key. You can put myoelectric pickups in at the same time you're doing the surgery to place these cuffs, all running through the same system, Bluetoothing out to the uh, prosthetic itself so you can drive the, the, the uh, prosthetic in real time. This is uh, one of the more recent ones. This is 109. You can see it does get to be quite a bit of spaghetti, but here we have two of the finds on radial and ulnar. We have eight channels of myoelectric uh, or of uh, real-time EMG pickups. All of these long guys are the connectors. Thankfully, there's a yet smaller version of this now available. Uh, these are the connectors outside the skin at the moment because this is still a percutaneous array. But uh, the idea to upgrade is that you can simply unplug these, plug the pacemaker hub housing the circuitry into these and switch them over. So thank you for your attention. Dr. Hardesty. Good question. Uh, in the cats, yes. In the humans, not so much. These are, uh, you know, these are amputees. They have most of these guys were using myoelectric external pickups ahead of time. So uh, we're generally these are people who are using a heavy prosthetic already. So I don't think we're putting any different demand on them. Right, thank you.